Good afternoon and a warm welcome everyone. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to another panel event organized by the Council on Geostrategy, the newest foreign affairs think tank based in the heart of London and dedicated to making the United Kingdom, as well as other free and open nations, more united, stronger and greener. Yesterday, on 26th of May, Georgia celebrated 30 years of independence. The country's road since the restoration of independence has been bumpy and full of challenges, including the Russian invasion back in 2008, which resulted in the illegal occupation of 20% of country's territory. Yet at the same time, the country has made a significant progress in achievements in reforming itself, strengthening its democracy, building a free society and improving its economy. Today, we have a wonderful opportunity to hear from Her Excellency Ambassador Sophie Katsaraba, the Ambassador of Georgia to the United Kingdom, Tom Tugenhat, Chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, and Dr. Nick Sam Karate, Chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Georgian Parliament, about Georgia's evolution, our bilateral relations, and British support for the security of the Black Sea region. And I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our first panelist, Her Excellency Ambassador Sophie Katsaraba. Ambassador Katsaraba was appointed as Ambassador of Georgia to the United Kingdom in April 2020. Prior to this appointment, she was Chair of the Parliament of Georgia's Foreign Affairs Committee. Before becoming an MP, Ambassador Katsaraba worked at the British Embassy in Tbilisi for many years. Having served 11 years at the British Embassy in Belize, she was awarded an MBE by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II for her outstanding contribution to strengthening bilateral relations between Georgia and the United Kingdom. I'm also very pleased to present our second panelist, Chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, Tom Tugenhat, who is also our Advisory Council member. Tom Tugenhat is a parliament member for Tonbridge and Matt Molling. Before entering politics, he was a lieutenant colonel in the British Army. And after leaving the British Army, he worked on the Army strategy team helping prepare for the 2015 Strategic Defence and Security Review. In 2017, he was elected as a chairman of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. And finally, we are delighted to be joined by chair of the Foreign Relations Committee of the Parliament of Georgia, Dr. Sam Karate. Dr. Sam Karate worked at the National Security Council of Georgia and later at EU Special Representative's Office to the South Caucasus. He also served as Chief of Cabinet of the Speaker of the Parliament for four years. Dr. Sam Karate is a Professor of International Relations at Belize State University and National Defense Academy. He holds a PhD in International Relations and Master's Degree in European Studies. So before we start our, our fascinating discussion today, um, a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, our panelists will speak for about 25 to 30 minutes and the remaining time will be dedicated for our Q&A session with the audience. Please do not hesitate to ask your questions during the whole course of the event, but please also do make sure that you indicate your name, your affiliation and to whom you are addressing your question. So without any further delay, I would like to invite Her Excellency Ambassador Katsarawa to start today's discussion. Greetings to all participants and many thanks to the Council on Geostrategy and personally to you, Victoria, for hosting the event dedicated to Georgia's 30th anniversary. Special thanks to Tom Tugendhat, Chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee at the House of Commons and Nick Samparadze, Chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the Georgian Parliament for being our keynote speakers today. Thanks all participants for your interest and engagement. Georgia marked the Independence Day in Tbilisi yesterday. What was particularly striking is the flow of most friendly and supportive messages from our partners across the world. Despite the pandemic, which has caused lots of obstacles for all of us, we have seen consolidation and support once again, reaffirmed by all our partners. Let me take this opportunity to once again thank Tom and Jonathan Janogli, chair of the APPG, who is, I guess, attending today's webinar, and other friends of Georgia for your warm words of congratulations on the occasion of our independence. Well, given today's topic of discussion, I thought the best way to illustrate the dynamics of Georgia's development 
is to show you the big picture of where Georgia was in the early 90s and the journey we have been through over the three decades, which at the same time, as you rightly pointed out, Victoria was full of challenges, but with impressive progress and a lot of achievements to be proud of. So once Georgia regained its independence in the early 90s after decades of Soviet occupation, independence was followed by a long period of turbulence, severe civil confrontation, a devastating social economic crisis, lost territories and waves of refugees in our own country. Some of you visiting Georgia in the 90s may well remember the state of play, what it looked like and where it stands now with its aspirations. Georgia was damaged, torn apart and steeped in corruption. Today, it transformed itself as a democratic country with free society underpinned by freedom of speech, free media, a competitive, supportive, free business environment and a free civil society. In the late 90s, our partners saw the importance of Georgia's strategic geopolitical location and what I would call the centuries project of the Baku Tbilisi Chehan pipeline was launched to improve Georgia's standing in the world. Today's Georgia is equally relevant and important, and we are part of a number of energy and infrastructure projects, such as, for example, Southern Gas Corridor, Trans Anatolian Pipeline, and others, to diversify energy supply and strengthen connectivity. For these projects to develop further, Georgia clearly needs stable environment, which in current regional and geopolitical context and in the times of misinformation too, cannot be taken for granted. It requires a lot of effort, resilience, leverage, further consolidation, partnership and information sharing. Or even if we look at developments 13 years ago, Georgia was facing existential challenges such as the consequences of the russian georgia war in 2008 and the global economic crisis of 2009. The occupation is still ongoing and every day we have to face different security challenges, but we still manage to develop and today we enjoy free trade agreements with the UK, DCFTA with the EU, Turkey, CIS countries, European Free Trade Association countries and China. We know where we have been and we know we where we want to be and we know that partners are important. Nothing has demonstrated to us than the current pandemic as a global community, how important partnerships and cooperation are. Every partnership that we have made has contributed to Georgia's growth over the 30 years and helped us become more independent. A recent example in Kiev, foreign ministers of Georgia, Moldova and Ukraine met to sign a memorandum of understanding, establishing an associated trio as a format to enhance cooperation and dialogue with the European Union on matters of European integration. Georgia's commitment to officially apply for EU membership by 2024 remains very strong. Or equally, our cooperation with NATO is as strong as ever been. For almost a decade, Georgia remained the largest non-NATO contributor and the fourth largest troop contributor to the resolute support mission in Afghanistan. With the Black Sea, um, with the, with the Black Sea region acquiring a special significance with direct implications for European security, we have been deepening our cooperation with NATO on the Black Sea security through strategic discussions, regular exchange of information, joint training and exercises. The UK's recent integrated review uh, has once again demonstrated its interest and engagement in the Black Sea security. And this is an area where we will enhance our dialogue with the UK and other partners. This is all good and we have a very clear vision of where we are heading and where we want to be. However, we have all seen the power of misinformation and no country is an exception or is immune to the threats of misinformation or cyber attacks, hybrid warfare. The most recent example too, also showing and demonstrate, demonstrating the partnership between the UK and Georgia of prompt and coordinated cooperation on cyber attack was in 2020, when the UK, Georgia and other partners exposed the GRU's responsibility for a number of significant cyber attacks against Georgia. Um, building cyber security resilience, I know that is UK's one of the priorities and I'm pleased that 
our partnership in cybersecurity continues to grow, supporting Georgia to build resilience against hostile state actors. Or if we look at the scale of misinformation across the social media or different platforms and the damage it causes, it does not only have an impact on democracies, but more broadly threatens humanity, such as you know, mis misinformation on the pandemic, causing vaccine hesitancy as an example, and which is also, and it's happening now. We have not yet begun to understand the threat and damage caused by misinformation across the world. And the international community needs to develop the understanding and response options. Georgia is part of it, so the whole world is, and we need to work together to better understand these issues to uphold rules-based system and freedoms that we all enjoy. Uh, certainly, there is a lot um, that we can talk about when it comes to UK-Georgia bilateral relations, be it the free trade agreement, a strategic partnership agreement that we have signed with the, with the UK. Uh, and this is a lot of opportunity that it offers to our countries, to Georgia, to, um, to explore the uh, potential which is out there. And we are working very hard, especially now during the pandemic, once we bounce back, or once we bounce forward uh, to, to use all the untapped potential which exists. Uh, and, 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 uh, and the point is that the potential is out there uh, and, and the, the ties are strong. Uh, and our objective is to, uh, to build on and capitalize on all, uh, all the successes and the success stories uh, that we've got bilaterally and multilaterally as well. So as much as defense and security is important, and we all acknowledge that this is one of the key areas of our cooperation um, with the UK, with the United States, European Union, and all our partners, I think for the nation, uh, for the nation, for any nation really, and for Georgia too, nothing is more important than our people and independence and greater relations with our partners has enabled Georgia to also be part of the global community of culture. So. Uh, a bit of soft power in addition to, uh, to security, uh, political dialogue, defense. Georgia is becoming a synonymous word on the world stage for its wine, food, rugby, and beautiful countryside. So I see my role in the coming years in the UK, and I do see a lot of support from our friends in the UK to pop up everywhere to raise Georgia's profile as a safe and stable country. And what's more important, the country that it is to invest, visit, enjoy its beauty and the warmth. And I hope that post pandemic period will be exactly the right time to, um, to explore all these areas and to welcome our British friends to Georgia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Katsurawa, for your important insights. And Mr. Chigenhat, the UK and Georgia are great partners and have a good working record of working together on numerous issues. Could you please tell us more about our bilateral relations and why our partnership is so important? Well, thank you very much indeed for inviting me. And the Ambassador has uh, unsurprisingly covered so much of the essential relationship, having been not only been uh, uh, our ambas uh, the, the ambassador of Georgia here, but in many ways, our ambassador to Georgia as well, for which she was quite rightly recognized uh, and has done so much to pro promote the relationship. You'll forgive me for not going over existing grounds. Worst of all, of course, not only has the ambassador done both those jobs, but she's also done my job uh, in the Georgian parliament. So forgive me as I, as I, as I find myself reduced uh, in what I can say because she's covered so much. So rather than going over history and going over the relationship that she covered so brilliantly and, and, and so uh, astutely, I thought I'd look to the future and talk about where I think the UK's interests lie and where I think, um, and I know that uh, the next speaker, Nick, is going to correct me, where I hope that our interests lie together. Let me start from the beginning. The reality is that the UK doesn't have a direct connection to Georgia. We may share a patron saint, but actually our people are quite a long way apart. So why do we care? Why do we care about Tbilisi? Why do we care about a people that has uh, found its freedom 30 years ago and has done so much to shape the culture of the region? Well, we care because the reality is that there are few countries in the world 
who have stood up and promoted the values that Georgia has. There are a few who have stepped forward at moments of need, as Georgians did uh, in uh, the early days of Iraq. There are a few countries who have uh, expressed support in such visible ways, who have argued so strongly in international fora for the same sort of values that we have. And Georgia is one of them. And that's why it matters to us. But it matters more than that. It matters because in a region that is enormously troubled, whether you're looking at uh, the threats of uh, various forms of radicalism that arise in some of the Russian Federation or indeed in other states, if you're looking at the clashes, some of them deeply historic between some of the neighboring states, if you're looking at uh, the pressures that some of the uh, ancient empires rather to the south uh, now pose to different areas in the region. It's quite clear that we need friends, not just to stabilize, but in order to secure our interests. And Georgia provides, frankly, the best friend we have. And so I think for the UK, Georgia matters and our relationship therefore matters. Now, as we look at the occupation of South Ossetia and Abkhazia, we remember that Georgia is not only on the front line, but in many ways, part of it is behind the front line of a conflict that we are seeing fought out in different areas around Europe as well. Because we can't pretend that our relationship with Georgia has nothing to do with Russia. Of course it does. In the same way as our relationship to Ukraine does, our relationship to Poland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, all of them have a relationship to Russia. And this is not an anti-Russian statement. It's a reflection on the reality that Russia is now the last major state destabilizing the peaceful order of Europe. And we see it not just in the occupation of various countries, Crimea, Ossetia, and so on, but in the threats to civil aviation, to, uh, to individuals around Europe, to prime ministers in Montenegro, to dissidents in London that we have seen over recent years. And so building up that partnership that sees us taking on not Russia, but the Putin cabal that has now colonized the country, and has taken over the Kremlin is absolutely fundamental to defending our liberties and finding partners with whom we can do that, partners who we can trust is absolutely essential. And that's where, again, Georgia comes in. So let's build on that and let's ask, where does this mean that we're going? Well, I think this is where we've got to look at the challenges that we all face and how we can work together to defend them. Now, Georgia's democracy provides a very stable platform from which to build. Yes, there are problems. There are problems with most democracies around the world at the moment. But the truth is that Georgia has been through various different uh, processes of, of iteration, as it were, uh, since uh, independence 30 years ago, and has established itself as a democratic power in the region, despite occupation and despite threats. So how we build up from that is absolutely essential. And I think this is where we need to be talking about how we partner, not just in military terms, although that does matter, and intelligence terms, although again, that does matter, but how we deepen our trade cooperation and deepen our partnership in many other areas. Because the reality is that unless Georgia can pay for itself, Georgia will never be uh, truly independent. And so we need to work out ways in which we encourage the bilateralism that is so essential. Now, Georgia has already taken many steps in this direction, and you just need to look at the way that Georgia has been investing very heavily in its relationship with the European Union to see that it's already progressing a long way down the line. And whether or not we're members of the European Union, much of our law is aligned in commercial terms with uh, our nearest neighbours. And so aligning with Georgia is not a terribly difficult thing to do. So I look forward to seeing uh, now uh, non-EU Britain uh, doing much more bilateral action in places like Tbilisi. Now, over coming years, I hope very much that one of the other things that we'll start to do is to deepen the relationship of peoples. Because while it's certainly true that there are many uh, living bridges, as uh, Prime Minister Modi of India puts it, between um, Georgia and, uh, well, he puts it between India and Britain, but I'm going to put it between uh, Georgia and Britain. The truth is there's an awful lot more that we can do. And deepening university cooperation, deepening scientific cooperation, I think is an area where, frankly, we haven't done enough. Now, going forward, I think there's also areas of 
um, parliamentary and diplomatic engagement, where I think we really do need to think hard about how we partner. Now, for those of uh, you who may remember, I don't know uh, how many on this call will do, but um, Liam Fox used to have a very strong uh, engagement with Georgia uh, when he was Defence Secretary and his uh, then advisor, Luke Coffey, maintained that and invested very heavily on it, even after his return to the United States, and I'm sure some of you on this call will know him. Um, but there are others in government and in the UK system who have uh, had a long connection to Georgia. I'm one of them, but there are many others. And so finding ways of deepening that living bridge, I think, is essential because we are only going to get the level of understanding that we require by actually having the interactions. So I look forward to deepening that because I think the way that Britain needs to look at not just uh, the world, but actually more specifically at Eastern Europe, the Caucasus region and those parts of the Near East is to think of ourselves not as a global power, but as an enabling power. Because the reality is that there are many parts that Georgian diplomats can reach that British can't, but they require the support of a larger embassy network than Georgia may have. So looking at ways of enabling Georgia, of sharing the interests and values that we both hold and making sure that by promoting Georgia and promoting Georgia's interests, we're also promoting our own, I think is a partnership that we can see, not just by the way with Georgia, but in partnership with other countries, including I don't know, Lithuania and many others. So I hope very much that this is an area we will look at exploring because Britain's place is not as a global state in the 19th century sense, but as a global state in the 21st century sense. And that means looking at the network power, the sharing of expertise, the promotion of knowledge and the reinforcement of individual rights of other states uh, around the world none more so i hope than georgia so there we go happy independence day uh, for yesterday it is a huge privilege to be with you today and i now look forward to hearing nick correct me on everything thank you very much mr tugenhard and dr sankaradze um the progress your country has made over the past 30 years is significant you are chair of the foreign relations committee of the parliament of georgia and I wanted to, to ask you, what will you and your parliament prioritize when it comes to foreign policy and defense policy in the upcoming years? Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for this opportunity and for having me on this, uh, this distinguished panel. Uh, I have a difficult task of uh, covering uh, lots of uh, topics in, in less than 10 minutes, but I'll, I'll, I'll try my best. Uh, well, uh, Georgia 30 years ago uh, was a failing state, uh, uh, embroiled in uh, a civil war, uh, separatist uh, conflicts, uh, endemic uh, corruption, and uh, nobody would have thought that uh, 30 years later Georgia would uh, be the top reformer in, in Eastern Europe and then a NATO um, aspirant country uh, against all, uh, all odds. Uh, so the question uh, why we have developed uh, uh, so uh, quickly and uh, so unexpectedly, let's say, uh, lies uh, in, uh, in Georgian society. Uh, the uh, the uh, quest for democracy, for human rights, for uh, liberal order uh, is not uh, elite driven, but uh, it, comes, uh, it comes from the values of the, uh, of the Georgian society. Uh, it has lived through uh, many difficult uh, years. It has um, experienced, uh, as I said, uh, uh, 300,000 uh, internally displaced persons who, uh, rather than uh, generating wealth and generating income and uh, growing Georgian economy, were, uh, are dependent on, on uh, social aid uh, from the state. It has lived through uh, dictatorial and semi-dictatorial regimes, and it has come to a conclusion that the right way uh, for Georgian society and for the Georgian state uh, to, um, uh, to go ahead and to prosper is uh, to build a democratic society which respects the rule of law and uh, fundamental human rights uh, and an inclusive society. Uh, as you know, Georgia is a multicultural country. We have uh, uh, quite a, uh, about one 
third, uh, roughly, uh, ethnic uh, minorities, also uh, religious minorities, and uh, the society came to a conclusion that we need to build a coherent, um, inclusive uh, state. Uh, now, uh, let me give you a, a, just uh, uh, several uh, figures in order to show the best where Georgia, uh, Georgia is now. Um, this is uh, Georgia was notorious for uh, for corruption. I think it was one of the worst countries uh, uh, in the world in the early 90s uh, when it came to corruption uh, corruption index. Uh, now, according to the World Bank 2020 uh, survey, uh, the new Inter enterprise survey, Georgia was ranked uh, in the top 10 countries of the world in terms of uh, low bribery uh, prevalence. Uh, Georgia. In the rule of law index uh, 2020 by uh, world justice project is uh, the best country among 14 uh, eastern european and uh, central asian uh, countries so we are the leading country in the region in the in the wider region including eastern europe uh, and um, we are uh, one of the best in the top uh, 20 uh, countries in when it comes to the uh, to, to internet uh, freedom uh, and uh, Georgia ranks ahead of 14, one for uh, EU member countries in terms of uh, corruption control and in terms of effectiveness of the government. Uh, and uh, uh, this, is a, this is a remarkable achievement when, uh, we, uh, when we also take into consideration that uh, this go, uh, the, all of this development uh, happened against uh, the background of uh, Russian aggression and um, uh, Russian occupation. Uh, Georgia is, is, is an open country. Uh, we are uh, seventh in the World Bank uh, doing business um, uh, ranking in the world, ahead of uh, you know many uh, more prosperous countries uh, than Georgia. Uh, in the last 15 years, uh, we had uh, economic growth of uh, five percent uh, annually, and this again against the background of uh, Russian embargo, against the background of uh, conflicts in in our vicinity in the region and where. Uh, our neighbors uh, have been economically uh, economically sanctioned. Uh, so, um, in that uh, regard, I think uh, we really can be proud of our uh, of our achieve achievements in the last uh, in the last uh, thirty years. Now, uh, to your question, what is our uh, main uh, priority, foreign policy priority? Uh, it is, uh, of course, NATO membership and the uh, EU membership. Uh, as for NATO membership, um, Georgian armed forces, uh, 80 to 85% of Georgian uh, defense forces have uh, participated in uh, NATO-led uh, missions. So that means that uh, uh, there is no question about military compatibility of Georgia's uh, defense forces um, with NATO. And uh, when, we, when it comes to political, uh, uh, let's say, side of it, uh, I think uh, NATO should take a courageous step and uh, bring Georgia uh, into NATO because um, this would be a clear signal uh, to Russia that Russia does not have a veto right over the uh, NATO expansion uh, in, uh, in the East. Uh, as for uh, EU membership, this is our, also one of our foreign policy uh, priorities. And uh, we have uh, made a uh, pre-election pledge to our society that uh, in 2024, uh, Georgia will apply officially uh, for the EU membership. Now, what does that mean? Uh, that means that uh, by 2024, we have to implement two thirds of the association agreement, which we have signed uh, with the European Union. And the association agreement itself consists, uh, is uh, by two thirds itself is, uh, uh, the accession consists of accession criteria. So we are hopeful uh, that um, uh, despite the COVID pandemic and the economic hardship that it has brought um, about, uh, we will be able to implement 50% uh, of the accession criteria by 2024, and then we will have a solid moral and also legal, uh, let's say, uh, ground uh, for applying uh, for, the, uh, for the EU membership. And then we know it's, uh, it will, it's gonna be a lengthy process. It will take uh, years before Georgia will become an, uh, an EU member, but at least um, we, our society and our public uh, will know that uh, this is the way uh, Georgia is uh, heading to. Plus we have made this a constitutional clause 
The Georgian constitution now says that NATO integration, NATO membership actually, and EU membership is the top foreign policy priority uh, of Georgia. Now, all of this um, uh, uh, in parallel, uh, there, are, there is a regional tension, uh, deteriorating security situation in the region. We witnessed uh, the uh, second Karabakh war uh, in, in September, uh, November the, last year, which has further uh, increased the Russian influence in the region. Uh, for the first time since the fall of the Soviet Union, now Russia has military bases in all three South Caucasus states. Uh, in Georgia, it's the occupied regions. Uh, in Armenia, there, there was uh, a 102nd Russian military base in the north of Armenia. Now they have also relocated to the south. And on the Azerbaijani uh, soil, now there is a military base of uh, Russian peacekeepers. Uh, uh, with, uh, and that means that uh, there are about 25,000 uh, Russian uh, boots um, in the region. Uh, plus, uh, we have uh, an escalation uh, in uh, Ukraine uh, and uh, not very, uh, I would say, encouraging uh, developments uh, in, um, in, uh, in Turkey, in, in Iran, uh, which means that uh, Georgia uh, is a country, the only pro-Western, I would say, country in the region. Uh, which is uh, becoming an aisle of, uh, of uh, democracy, uh, requiring a much stronger support uh, from the West uh, in order uh, to keep uh, its pro-Western uh, determination uh, and also uh, to uh, advance on some of the most uh, uh, fundamental reforms in order to become uh, in order to become member uh, member of the European uh, Union uh, and NATO, so uh, this is um, this is very briefly, in a nutshell, uh, the situation uh, in uh, the country and around us. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, a, an artificial uh, political crisis uh, in the country, and uh, I'm very happy that uh, with the mediation of the European Union, um, uh, your president of the Council. Uh, this uh, crisis has been uh, overcome. Now we have uh, seven uh, political opposition political parties in the parliament, but unfortunately, the, the biggest opposition party, uh, uh, UNM, has not, uh, has not signed this uh, uh, agreement mediated by the EU and is, uh, still, uh, is uh, still out of the parliament and uh, remains in the street. Unfortunately, uh, this party has chosen a very destructive and I would say anti-systemic uh, role uh, in uh, in Georgia and uh, and uh, this uh, this will lead to to, uh, to marginalization of that uh, party. But uh, we are hopeful that uh, with the rest of uh, opposition now for the first time Georgia's parliament is uh, pluralistic. Uh, as I said, it has uh, seven opposition uh, parties, and uh, together with uh, with them, we hope uh, to uh, bring Georgia forward uh, to avert the external pressures. Uh, that are uh, emanating from uh, from Russia and be ready uh, in 2024 to apply uh, officially for the EU membership. By that time, I hope that the NATO will take a political uh, decision and will also uh, bring Georgia as a full member uh, into its uh, into its reign. So I will stop here and I will give uh, more time for for uh, for questions. I think that would be more um, uh, more relevant at this stage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Samkaradze. Um, and we can then open up to our Q&A session. And the very first question is from uh, Member of Parliament, Jonathan Ginogli. Um, it would seem that Georgia often attempts to ring fence, but not ignore its Russian issues in order to accentuate its positives. Is this becoming harder given continued Russian aggression? And what more can Georgia's friendly states and supporters do to, as, to assist its continued advance towards NATO and the EU membership? Ambassador Katsurava, would you like to, to start? Of course, thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, and again, I did uh, mention uh, your contribution and your very warm uh, message uh, of congratulations yesterday uh, for the Independence Day. And again, big thank you for all your support uh, to, to our country. Well, um, uh, certainly uh, what, what's, um, what our key um, 
we, we spoke about what our key foreign policy priorities are, uh, EU integration, NATO integration, uh, but at the same time, uh, there, is, uh, there is a threat, um, um, and, and conventional threat actually, uh, occupied territories, which is still there, and this is certainly a big security challenge for, for Georgia. But at the same time, I think in, in both, uh, in all three of us, uh, we, we spoke um, about uh, the, the line of, uh, between the security threats that Georgia is facing, but at the same time, the progress uh, that Georgia has been demonstrating throughout these years. Not to disregard the occupation, no, we keep raising this issue and that needs to be, uh, and we, we continue to be vocal about uh, occupied territories because uh, unless it is solved, it will remain a big challenge for us and not just for us, for the region and for the European community as well. But at the same time, we, uh, we want to demonstrate and to show to the rest of the world um, about the progress that Georgia is making. It is crucially important because it also chimes with some other questions that we, uh, we, we saw here. Uh, what else we can do to improve, um, uh, uh, improve UK-Georgia uh, relations? So trade, for example, unless there is confidence from our partners that Georgia is a safe and a stable country to invest, to trade with, it, 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 is, uh, it will be very difficult to um, to, you know, um, to, to convince uh, potential um, uh, investors, if you like, whether it's the UK or any other country. So th there is a fine line uh, which, um, which we keep addressing, that occupation is there, there is a lot of misinformation, disinformation also coming uh, from, uh, from, from Russia, but at the same time we need to get our key message across, and that's what we are doing. The, and, and this webinar is one of those examples, why this kind of communication, this kind of events matter to Georgia, whether it's here in the UK or any other country, to build the confidence of our partners that uh, we need more uh, engagement of our partners in, in not just in Georgia, but in the entire region. And it's not by chance that we uh, keep praising the profile of the Black Sea security, the role of Georgia, the role of Ukraine um, uh, in, in the Black Sea security region. And we are glad that there is a, an increasing interest, um, especially from the UK, because that's my key interest and my, uh, my, my, my sphere of interest to see that engagement is there in the, in the Black Sea security. So basically the the answer is there is a lot. Um, uh, we, we do have a lot of support from the from the UK and from the in, entire international community, but in order to, uh, uh, but but there is we, we can show more support when it comes to Georgia's NATO integration process because there is no secret that um, uh, Georgia is ready to become member of NATO. Uh, there is a political decision to be made about NATO uh, membership uh, uh, and the process itself uh, is, is quite challenging, whereas, um, and it plays into the hands of uh, those countries in whose interest it is not that Georgia uh, uh, becomes a member of NATO, becomes a member of uh, the European Union, uh, and, and therefore it is very important that we get uh, more political support, more vocal support from our partners, whether it is the UK, the US, strategic partners, uh, uh, and the European Union. I think that, that that's what Georgia needs at the moment, as never before. Thank you. Mr. Tugendhat, would you like to add anything? The problem I have is the ambassador is so complete in her answers, it doesn't leave very much scope. Uh, look, the reality is there's an awful lot of cooperation that we need to invest in going forward. And we all know, and it's not a particularly big secret, that there is an initial uh, issue with um, Georgia's membership of NATO, which is sadly that part of the country is currently occupied, and that poses a problem for allies. 
That doesn't mean that there is a long standing or rather an enduring obstacle. And I look forward very much to um, the liberation of Georgian territory and uh, the inclusion of Georgia in any partnership or alliance that chooses to join. It would be enormously welcome in uh, NATO. And you'll forgive me, I won't comment about the European Union as that's not a matter for me. Thank you. And Dr. Samkaradze, would you like to add anything? Yes, uh, they, uh, I would say uh, there are uh, two ways uh, what uh, the uh, Georgia's friends and supporters uh, can do. Uh, first, uh, it's, uh, of course, uh, providing uh, uh, some kind of a security umbrella uh, for Georgia. Uh, we understand the, the difficulties uh, connected with, um, with our membership to NATO, but at least uh, a more presence in the Black Sea area, more, uh, more presence of uh, NATO um, trainings on the, uh, on the Georgian territory would uh, act as a deterrence uh, against, um, against Russian uh, provocations. I think the West uh, should signal uh, to Russia that uh, they will not tolerate uh, the, uh, the intimidation of Georgia uh, and uh, creating uh, further security challenges. Uh, for Georgia. The second uh, is, of course, economic development. Uh, I think, uh, and uh, when I say economic development, it's, uh, it's uh, very important that we get more and more investments uh, from, the, uh, from the West, uh, be it uh, European Union, UK, or, or, or the United States. This is what we are lacking uh, currently. Uh, if, you look at, uh, if you look at Georgia's um, investment map, uh, you, you will hardly find uh, many, uh, many Western countries, uh, countries there. And, and I understand this is because of the security reasons, but uh, they, uh, I think here we have, uh, we have room for improvement. In the current COVID crisis, I think uh, an act of uh, support and solidarity would be providing Georgia with, uh, with vaccines. Um, uh, we unfortunately, the only platform where we get uh, vaccines from is, is the COVAX platform, and and uh, sadly, the COVAX platform has not uh, proved its uh, its efficiency. And uh, then we are uh, negotiating bilaterally, bilaterally as a state with um, uh, with uh, uh, producer companies. Uh, so uh, I think vac uh, vaccines could be also one of the. Uh, uh, let's say immediate uh, steps that could be taken by uh, Georgia's uh, friendly countries uh, to support. Because uh, uh, I, I, I did not uh, mention it, but last year, 2020, was the worst year in terms of economic uh, decline since 1993, when Georgia was a fa failed state. So uh, I, you can imagine how mm -hmm how uh, grave uh, the economic uh, situation has become uh, due to COVID because Georgia largely, uh, largely uh, lives, uh, I mean, uh, Georgian um, households uh, are also uh, very much dependent on tourism sector, uh, which, uh, which was booming before uh, 2020. And now Georgia is losing around uh, 4 billion uh, USD annually because of, uh, because of, uh, a lack of tourists. So uh, this could be uh, directions that uh, that the West, Western friends of Georgia uh, can support us. Thank you so much, Dr. Samakadze. And the next question is from Daniel Hamilton, who's a managing director at FTI Consulting, but is speaking in a personal capacity. So first of all, um, thank you to the three outstanding panelists today and congratulations to Georgia on its 30th anniversary of independence. I would be fascinated to hear your perspectives on how Georgia can unlock the apparent impasse on NATO accession. It seems Georgia is the best people in the class, but when compared to the likes of Albania and Montenegro, whose applications have pressed ahead, is the only one not allowed to advance to the next grade. Similarly, I would really welcome any observations you may have on the role Georgia can play in stabilizing the ongoing tensions between Armenia and Azerbaijan, as well as future dialogue with Iran. Ambassador Katsaraba. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, uh, for your questions um, and, uh, well, um, your knowledge of Georgia and the region is um, uh, absolutely 
uh, outstanding. Um, uh, well, NATO accession, this is uh, this is the point that uh, well, all of us already I think made. Uh, this is NATO integration is one of the one of the key foreign policy priorities. We do everything on the way in terms of the reforms. Well, and you know that you also mentioned that we are the best people in the class. So there is no question about that. It's about consolidation. It's it's about the decision making, uh, and it's about the it's about more support, more more political support, and more confidence uh, in Georgia, and more uh, consolidation amongst allies to to make the decision. Uh, I mean, as as much as co the complex the issue is, it's as simple as that. Uh, Georgia, as a country, uh, has been preparing and is ready to become a member of NATO, but we need to get the consolidated approach from our allies when it comes to Georgia's NATO integration. Um, uh, and, and you would consistently hear from NATO uh, as an organization and individual partners, and particularly UK and US, are always very vocal and supportive when it comes to Georgia's NATO integration, that Georgia is ready um, and has got all practical tools for, to become NATO, but it's all about uh, the, the, the allies uh, and the members of NATO to uh, to come to the, to, to the decision. But in the meantime, I think, uh, and this is the key communication message as well uh, to, to the Georgian public, because you may know that um, the overwhelming majority of the Georgian public supports NATO and EU integration, which is which is fantastic, and this is this is because uh, of, of uh, the strategies, uh, strategy that that Georgia has, and the communication strategy, strategy that it has. In the first place, we want to make our country resilient, strong, uh, and obviously the ultimate goal is to become member of these institutions. So um, uh, we, we 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 consistently strive uh, for for this to happen, and it's again it's about consolidation and the decision making. Uh, when it comes to Georgia's role in the region, I think it's also no surprise and no news that Georgia, with its um, A strategic location, B being in quite a volatile region, uh, uh, it, it tries to not just maintain peace and stability in the country, because ultimately in the big picture, uh, for our international community, the entire region also matters. So we have full acknowledgement of that, and we play a role of a country which is always ready to give a hand when there is a need, you know, of such uh, support to uh, to to contribute to the stability in the region. Whether it's Armenia, Azerbaijan, and the entire region, Georgia has a very um, uh, Georgia has always had a special role in that and maintains that role uh, and the ambition uh, to to play when it is needed, if it is needed, uh, uh, for, for, for its own safety and security and stability, but at the same time for the image uh, or and the perception of the entire region. Thank you. Dr. Sankaradze? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the question. I'll start with the uh, second one uh, about Georgia's stabilizing role um, in, the, in the Caucasus. Um, uh, several months ago when there was a uh, Karabakh uh, war, uh, Georgia really walked a very tight rope in order to, uh, in order to stay neutral um, in this conflict. And um, I think our, um, our, uh, our stance uh, has been greatly appreciated both by Yerevan and, and uh, Baku. Uh, this, of course, uh, gives us an opportunity uh, to make, uh, to turn Tbilisi into a, uh, into a venue of, uh, of um, uh, meetings and cooperation uh, between Azerbaijani and Armenian um, officials, uh, uh, of course, with the participation of, uh, of uh, Georgian side. Uh, so actually, uh, we are now uh, waiting for the, uh, for the snap elections in Armenia. And after that, uh, we plan uh, to invite uh, Armenian and uh, Azeri MPs, members of the parliament, uh, to start consultation about, uh, about low politics, uh, let's say about uh, 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 trade, uh, agriculture, uh, 
uh, environmental issues, uh, uh, tourism, uh, and maybe uh, uh, with that uh, starting point, it could then, uh, you know, grow into a more um, uh, uh, more ex extended dialogue about uh, about uh, other things, including uh, security. Uh, Georgia really has this uh, potential uh, to play an active role of mediation between uh, between Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, and uh, I think we should uh, we should capitalize on this. So uh, we we have certain plans in that regard. And uh, uh, but after the after the elections, um, uh, after the elections in Armenia, we'll start uh, we'll start implementing them. As for Iran, um, it's uh, it's more difficult because uh, Georgia does not share a a, a border with Iran. Uh, the Georgian Iranian uh, relations um, are limited to to trade relations. Um, and uh, we really do not have very close, uh, very close political uh, ties. Uh, however, uh, I, I, I can say that uh, Georgian-Iranian uh, relations uh, are uh, are normal. Uh, I, I, I would say it's uh, it's not uh, uh, it's not a strategic relations. It's uh, it's not really a very active, close political relations. But we have uh, we have normal uh, good relations. Uh, as for uh, as for the other uh, question, the impasse uh, with the NATO membership, uh, I think the the ball, as as, uh, as Sophie rightly said, the ball is in, in the court of NATO. Georgia has done um, everything, uh, including military reforms, uh, political reforms. Now, we are uh, very, uh, you know, motivated to further uh, the uh, the uh, the agenda, which is uh, the annual uh, national plan. Uh, that we have, uh, but NATO should come. Uh, I think uh, there, there, there is room for out of the box uh, thinking how we can, um, uh, we can uh, escape from the situation uh, which, is, uh, which is on the ground, which was created on the ground by Russia exactly for the reason of not allowing Georgia to become uh, a NATO member state. Uh, and we are ready for, uh, for any innovative um, ideas. Uh, we, we, we are ready to discuss them. Uh, I think um, we all understand that the major uh, stumbling point uh, is, uh, is, of course, the occupied regions and uh, how uh, these occupied regions uh, will be uh, affecting uh, uh, the general uh, situation if Georgia becomes, uh, becomes a NATO member. Thank you. The next question is from Mark Galiotti. As we've heard, the Russian threat to Georgia is not only military, but through the same COVID means, subversion, disinformation, destabilization that the UK faces as well. What specific measures might the UK adopt to help Georgia's wider security? But also how can Georgia help the UK given its own experiences dealing with these challenges? Mr. Tugendhat? Sure. Well, look, I have to say, this is where I see Georgia's integration with NATO really coming to the fore, because as I said earlier, there are, I'm afraid, two rather immediate challenges to NATO membership now, and they're called South Ossetia and Abkhazia. But the reality is that actually, in many ways, Georgia is already a NATO member in the sense that it already aligns to NATO standards in very many areas. And one area where really the relationship goes from being one of uh, a beneficial, uh, a beneficiary of the relationship to one of a major contributor is through information operations. George's understanding of, forgive me, but Soviet and now Russian uh, information operations is second to none. And the reality is that NATO is be benefiting enormously from the knowledge of Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Ukraine and Georgia in many of these areas, which is protecting the UK and protecting many other NATO partners. So it's a fundamental area of integration and cooperation. I think this is exactly where, when we talk about a platform of integration, what we're really talking about is a really deep partnership uh, and not of one side benefiting and the other side being independent, but the truth is of all benefiting from the shared values and shared understanding that we have for each other. So I have to say, I think this information question is absolutely fundamental, not just to uh, Georgia's place uh, you know, within the NATO firmament, but actually to the value of Georgia 
or to the understanding of the true value of Georgia to the whole of the Western Alliance, of which Georgia is an important member. So I hope very much this scenario will develop. Um, you know, we know we've got the Joint Info Ops Centre uh, in uh, NATO, and Georgia's contribution to it is extremely important. And as Mark knows very well, uh, distance is no obstacle to um, these tactics being used against us, but proximity and for too long, 80 or so years, occupation certainly taught Georgia uh, exactly what uh, tactics were being used. So I think this is an, an extremely important area where the UK and indeed every other NATO country can benefit from Georgia's knowledge. Thank you. Ambassador Katsuraba. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, well, I, I fully share what, uh, what Tom said. Uh, I think it, in the first place, in order to counter this information, and uh, I did uh, in my opening uh, remarks, I did speak about misinformation and the threats and that Georgia, that no country is immune and no country is exempt from, you know, uh, it, it, it's happening, it's out there, and we just need to acknowledge the threats that misinformation, disinformation, uh, are, 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 are imposing and, and what sort of threats they are causing. So uh, it's good that uh, we, we do talk about it. I mean, the international community understands the, the threats. Uh, but I think what is really important to counter all of that is being more and more resilient. Uh, and resilience is part of, you know, um, how, how, how we achieve resilience. It's about strong institutions. It's about, um, uh, it's about uh, consistency. Uh, and it's about, you know, uh, when, when we talk about Georgia's case, uh, it's about Georgia's consistent uh, foreign policy trajectory and the communication uh, and because uh, of our imminent neighborhood, I agree, Victoria, there might be, you know, more from the Georgia side to, to share with our partners who may not necessarily have that long experience um, uh, of, of, um, uh, of, of those threats. Uh, but I think every, uh, every nation, if not every uh, UK definitely have, has already experienced what it means. No. So I think what is really important is to, is again, work together, share information, share experience and countries to become more resilient. And resilience, as I said, it comes with strong, uh, stronger institutions. I also mentioned the close cooperation on cybersecurity, and that's a very good example of bilateral cooperation between UK and Georgia. So cybersecurity strategic communications that is one of the areas that we have been for many years working together working together because that also directly uh is linked with countering this information strategic communication being consistent about uh the reforms and this is what georgia does with the help of the uk with the help of the us and, and our european partners Thank you. Dr. Samkaradze, would you have anything to add? Yeah, just uh, very, uh, very shortly. Um, I think um, uh, the, uh, the advantage that the Georgian uh, authorities and but, but the wider society has is that uh, we know what uh, tactics Russia employs uh, for fake news, disinformation and propaganda. And uh, we, we, we have become uh, masters in detecting uh, their um, their propaganda and, and uh, fake news. So of course we can share this. Uh, uh, we can share this with our uh, partners in the UK. And uh, also uh, the cybersecurity has uh, becoming uh, another tool, uh, or, or cyber attacks have become another tool uh, by Russians to to undermine the stability. Uh, in the country, and uh, this is where I think Georgia and UK uh, should join forces and work more actively uh, on, um, on um, you know, deterring uh, Russian, uh, Russian cyber security attacks. Thank you. And uh, one more question from Derek Pickup, who's an honorary consul of Georgia. Um, Tom spoke about building close academic and university links between our countries. How does uh, how can this progress? 
Uh, well, look, I mean, there's an awful lot that we can do together and uh, the British Council does some of it and the embassy does other bits of it. But the idea, I think, and I think it's uh, one that we should aim to develop, is of having uh, scholarships and, and research partnerships between our universities. The reality is that if you uh, look at the um, uh, coastal, uh, forgive me, I, um, my mind has suddenly gone completely blank. The university on the coast, um, Ambassador, you're looking at me with a look of absolute horror, but I've completely forgotten my my words. Um, the um, but the, the 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 work being done on oceanography uh, by Georgian universities is extremely important. The work that's being done on various different forms of physics is extremely important, and there's a hell of a lot of areas of cooperation that I think that we should really be looking at. And I'd like to see uh, joint cooperation through joint funding and joint research. Thank you, Mr. Tugendhat. Atusi, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> we have many more questions, but unfortunately it is already 2 p.m. and we have to end our event marking 30 years of Georgia's independence. I would like to sincerely thank our panelists and the audience for active participation. I hope that you enjoyed the discussion today. I'm Victoria Starek Samolin, co-founder of the Council on Geo Strategy, and it's been a privilege to host and moderate today's event. We have now kick-started our events program and we will be bringing many more interesting and timely discussions on geostrategic challenges. You can check the upcoming events on our website and you can subscribe to our events on www.geostrategy.org.uk slash subscribe. Thank you very much and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.